to, to today's hearing examining ongoing efforts to increase public participation in organ donor programs. Organ donation is one of modern medicine's most effective life-saving therapies. In fact, over the last 20 years, more than 390,000 organ transplants have been performed successfully. Unfortunately, <clears throat> during that same period of time, the waiting list for an organ transplant has more than doubled. Last year in the United States, over 6,000 Americans died while waiting for their lives to be renewed through transplantation. Uh, as we convene this hearing, nearly 97,000 patients are waiting for an organ donation. This includes over 1,300 anxious men, women, and children uh, from my district in Missouri. Uh, after personally witnessing the devastating effects of patients trapped on dialysis, I am convinced that Congress must play a vital role in elevating the issue of organ and tissue donation to become a national priority. Uh, yesterday, I introduced H.R. 3635, the Everson Walls and Ron Springs Gift for Life Act to raise awareness and increase organ donation. Uh, this legislation would provide assistance to state organ donor programs and track the long-term health of individuals uh, generous enough to become organ donors. In addition, it establishes a national organ and tissue donor registry resource center charged with providing information, technical assistance, and grants to donor registries administered by the states. I would like to thank members of the transplant community for assisting me in crafting this legislation. And today we welcome a group of distinguished panelists from both the medical and patient communities, and I look forward to their testimonies. I also want to welcome uh, two guests uh, to this committee, uh, one being Representative Jim Costas of California, uh, who is also part of the uh, Organ and Tissue Donor Caucus here in the House. Thank you for being here, Mr. Costas, and you may uh, make an opening statement if you, if you care. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Chairman Clay, for inviting me to participate, to participate in uh, this afternoon's uh, hearing. Uh, your support and your passion for this issue uh, is well known, and uh, as, as an advocate on behalf of organ and tissue donation, our collective efforts, I believe, uh, will make a great difference. Uh, I'm pleased that uh, along with you, other of our colleagues uh, share uh, uh, in joining um, as uh, members of the Congressional Organ and Tissue Donation Awareness Caucus. Uh, a new caucus, a bipartisan caucus, to advocate on behalf of organ and tissue donations, uh, which too often, as you noted in your opening statement, is a forgotten part of the health debate. Uh, it's great to see athletes here today, like Mr. Everson uh, Walls, um, and uh, we hope that he'll be joined by Mr. Springs. Uh, we all know that football players, uh, it, it is the season, are often uh, idolized by their fans and revered for their athletic prowess. Uh, but uh, Mr. Walls comes uh, this afternoon and shares the passion with us uh, because he's not just a, uh, a holder of a Super Bowl ring uh, or uh, one who mustered 57 career interceptions, as I noted, I hope I got that correct. Sadly, I'm. Uh, I believe that a number of those interceptions were against the 49ers, my home team. <laughs> but nonetheless, with great respect, uh, Mr. Walls is a, is a hero uh, in every sense of the word. Um, his friend, Ron Springs, uh, who we hope to acknowledge as well, uh, was the recipient of uh, Mr. Walls' awareness and understanding that he had the gift of life. 
what we are talking about uh, are over 100,000 people, as the chairman noted, who are on the waiting list for organ transplants. Nearly uh, 6,000 of them pass away every year uh, before a much needed organ uh, becomes available to them. So we as members of Congress, we think we have to do more through our legislative efforts, through our advocacy uh, in creating uh, greater awareness of this issue and support and encourage uh, facilitating and collaborating organ and tissue donation process. We have a number of witnesses here who will testify in both the first and the second panel. I'm pleased to see Eunice and the round table of support groups uh, are uh, a important part of this collective effort. Uh, we will hear later from Dr. Timothy Pruitt and his predecessor, Dr. Sue McDermott, who is a longtime friend of mine who first brought my own awareness of the importance of the gift of life. That in fact, uh, we have so much that has been made in the way of progress in medical science. And that we as human beings have the opportunity to expand and to extend uh, others uh, through that gift of life. So Mr. Chairman, uh, I am looking forward to the testimony. There are over 300,000 uh, uh, minorities in my district uh, nearly 80,000 minorities nationwide are currently on the transplant list. Yet, uh, too many uh, of the minority donors still remain disproportionate, disproportionately low. Uh, I know that, Mr. Walls, through your testimony and your efforts with us, you will help us expand that awareness. And with the help of uh, strong role models such as yourself, uh, Congressman Clay and Dr. Callender, I know that we uh, stand to make great success uh, and progress uh, in our efforts. So this is truly wonderful and potentially a great effort and a noble one that we embark upon today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Costa, uh, for that opening statement. And now I'd like to recognize uh, my colleague who happens to be a chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, Mr. Silvestre Reyes. Thank you for being here. Th thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Clay. And uh, although I won't be able to, to stay for the hearing as I just uh, left one of my own, I uh, did want to come by and uh, thank publicly uh, uh, Everson Wells, uh, uh, or Cubby as he's known in Dallas, <laughs> <laughs> Cubby Wells. Uh, for uh, for really being the uh, uh, the driving force behind the uh, Everson Walls Ron Springs Gift for Life legislation, and I want to congratulate you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for uh, uh, forging that that legislation because it it really has I think the uh, ability to make a real difference in so many different communities around our our country and getting the message out, which is a very good news story uh, that uh, speaks volumes about not just friendship, but commitment uh, to uh, a teammate that uh, uh, we're also very, very proud of, of uh, Everson Walls uh, for what he did for, for Ron Springs. But, but more than that, I think for what he's about to do uh, through our collective efforts, for uh, uh, organ donors uh, and educating potential organ donors and so many, we hope, thousands and thousands of recipients that will benefit and enjoy a new, uh, better quality of life uh, through this uh, legislation. So I'm, uh, I'm proud to be here. Most of all, I'm proud uh, uh, to know Everson Walls and uh, the kind of uh, uh, character that he brings that is the springboard for this legislation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, now that the, the world and C-SPAN community knows that Everson Wall's nickname is Cubby, we welcome him, <laughs> him too. Uh, l let me say, with, without objection, uh, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials uh, for the record. And now, um, 
If there are no additional opening statements, the subcommittee will now receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. Uh, Ms. Rubin is on her way, so we will start with testimony uh, with Mr. Walls, and, and uh, let me first introduce him. Uh, Everson Walls is a retired NFL All-Pro cornerback, having played 14 seasons with the Dallas Cowboys, New York Giants, and Cleveland Browns. Uh, during his career, he was a four-time Pro Bowl selection three-time All-Pro selection and was part of the New York Giants 1990 Super Bowl championship team. Uh, more importantly, in February of this year, he became a kidney donor to his longtime teammate and friend, Mr. Ron Springs. Together, Mr. Walls and Mr. Springs now lead the Gift of Life Foundation in order to promote awareness early detection and preventive, prevention of kidney disease and its associated illnesses. And uh, let me thank you for being here today. And it is, it is the policy of the committee to swear in all witnesses before they testify. And I'd like you to, to uh, please stand and raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I let the record reflect the witness answered in the affirmative. Thank you. And uh, I ask that that um, that you give us your statement. There is a five-minute rule, uh, and of course, if you go over, we will uh, we will not flag you, Mr. Wall. <laughs> <laughs> you may proceed. Thank you, uh, Congressman Lacey Clay. I want to also thank some of your staff that uh, have been so helpful uh, in preparing me for this hearing, as well as uh, from the moment that I met you. Uh, I think that was back in July of this year. Uh, they've been very helpful in, in helping us, if nothing else, get the word out about becoming a living organ donor. Uh, that would be Michelle Mitchell, uh, Daryl, Piggy, uh, Adam Boards, uh, and also I want to thank Congressman Silvestri Reyes and the people on his staff, Perry Finney, I believe her name is Brody. 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 Uh, she was also very helpful. And Marvin Steele, who's also with, with uh, Congressman Clay's staff as well. So, you know, the day that uh, is so famous now uh, in my life and in many other people's lives is February the 28th. Uh, that was the day that I decided that I would lay down my life for a good friend of mine named Ron Springs. You know, whenever you make a decision uh, as strong as this one, that, that is as impactful as this one was, then there are just so many people that you have to consider. Because after all, anytime you make this type of a decision, you don't really make it by yourself. You know, you are always shaped by not just the, the experience that you've had in life, but also the people that you've come across. You know, my mom, uh, she's not here uh, now, but she's back in Dallas, as well as my father. Uh, I, I must uh, give some notice to them. Uh, my father's well in walls, my mother's we the walls. They would obviously be extremely proud to be here right now, but they couldn't make it. Uh, but. As soon as I get back home, I'm sure they want to hear everything blow by blow on exactly what happened here. And yes, uh, Mr. Costa, I did get a lot of interceptions against <laughs> the San Francisco 49ers. <laughs> but in defense of the 49ers, I got more against the Washington Redskins. <laughs> <laughs> I like to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so if there are any Cowboy fans out there, I'm sure they really appreciate maybe my presence as well as uh, Mr. Springs' uh, uh, spirit being here as well with us. You know, anytime you talk about making a life-changing decision, as I said, there are so many people that are involved with that. You know, I'm just a young man from Dallas, Texas, from a small community called Hamilton Park. It's an all-African-American community, community in Dallas that's been established since 1954. Uh, we've had a lot of great men and women come out of that community. 
And I think they will all be so proud of the fact that I am here right now speaking on this bill that you're trying to pass. Uh, one person I would have to say, you know, if Ron Springs wants to, help, wants to thank anyone uh, for what I've done for him, as it's, it's a long line of other people that he should thank. Number one is obviously my wife, Sherelle. Sherelle is a person that is great friends with Ron's wife, Adrian, and they're the kind of people that they can hang together all day at any event, whether it's a cookout, family reunion, graduation, or whatever. They can be with each other for eight hours, and when they come home, they're going to give each other a call <laughs> and talk about what went on at that particular event. She loves Ron as if he was a brother, and I knew that without her support, that there's no way I would be able to do this for Ron. You, you look at the people that have really shaped my character and my past, and you spoke of character, uh, Congressman Clay. Um, I have to, I would be remiss if I did not bring up uh, the late coach Eddie Robinson from Grambling State University. At the age of 17, I met this man, and uh, his, his influence on my life was just astronomical. Uh, Obviously, I was raised well by my parents, but when you start talking about raising a child, then you have to go back to the old adage of, it takes a village to raise a child. And Coach Robinson was aware of that. Uh, he was always a person that didn't care much about how a person played football, because he always wanted you first to emulate an American citizen in life. And if he knew that you were gonna be a great American citizen in life, then he would always feel that you could be, he could make you into a good football player. Consequently, we had championship years there, but that pales in comparison to the lessons that Coach Robinson taught me going through life. You know, I've, I've been associated with so many different types of coaches, obviously playing for 13, 14 years in the league, you, you should be associated with some good players and good coaches. Tom, Tom Landry from the Dallas Cowboys in the 80s was one of the most stern and disciplined and successful coaches to come through the NFL. I went on from the Cowboys to play with the New York Giants. Coach Bill Parcells, who was one of the most personable as well as stern coaches I've ever been around. Being around such intelligent coaches such as Bill Belichick with the Cleveland Browns as well. Anytime you're associated with these type of people, then you'd have to be a fool not to really learn something from them, not just through football, but also in life. My kids are also very proud of me as well as, as I'm proud of them. Uh, my oldest daughter, Charis Walls, she's a graduate of Southern University. My son, Cameron Walls, who's now attending Texas Southern University. These are, kid, these are my kids and they are, they are people that really, really care so much for what I did for Ron as well. Our families are so close that it was a really easy decision for me to make. Everyone always asks me, well, how could you lay down your life for someone who's not a family member? But when you look at Ron Springs and you look at the dynamics of both of our families, it's as if we are related because we are not only close through the careers that Ron and I had, but also uh, through our wives as well as our offsprings. His daughter, Era, and my daughter, Charis, are best friends. His younger daughter, Ashley, and my son, Cameron, are also very good friends. So when you talk about something that I did, it's almost as if he is a family member. You know, one thing that we realize about organ donation is that it, affect, it affects everyone. It can positively affect anyone in the future who may have any types of problems from chronic kidney disease, uh, on up to type 2 diabetes. Ron's situation was as unique as anyone's. Uh, he's just like anyone else, except that he's as stubborn a football player that you want to meet. He's a guy that felt that once he found out that he had uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, he ignored it, just as any uh, normal person would do. He was in denial about it just as any normal person would be. But the one thing about it was, as he started to realize 
how his body was being affected and afflicted by chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes. By that time, it was almost too late. He had, he had uh, had an amputation of his right foot. All of his toes on his left foot are also uh, amputated. And by, he was on dialysis for three and a half years. As I talked to his transplant doctor, uh, Dr. Dick Dickerman, Dr. Dickerman noted to me that Ron would not make it to his fifth year of uh, dialysis. And if anyone knows anything about dialysis, it's a process that is extremely invasive and literally draining to the human body. Your, your, all of your blood is drained from your body. It goes through a filter, and it goes back inside your body. And you're talking about a process that takes up to four to five hours a day. Well, Ron Springs was going through that for three days a week for three and a half years. He was on that kidney waiting list for three and a half years as well. And when it came down to his family trying to help him out, trying to give him aid, he had a niece that was willing to help. He had a nephew that also was willing to help. Those two uh, procedures were not successful. And when you take a look at the peaks and valleys that anyone that's afflicted with chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes will go through, it's really trying not just on you physically, but it's trying on your spirit. And I have to commend Ron himself for being so heroic in not giving up on life. Because when you take a look at what could happen with anyone who goes through the peaks and valleys that Ron went through, he could have easily given up on uh, the process. He could have easily given up on life. But because of his strong spiritual connection, he, he chose to hang in there. He chose to be strong, not just for himself, but also he realized that his family and friends cared so much about him. And I think that's what prompted me, uh, among other things, to help Ron Springs. Um, you know, it's one thing about being called a hero. Uh, you're really put up on a pedestal. But I want, what I want people to know is that you don't want to put that pedestal up too high because we want everyone to realize that as long as you have two good kidneys, that you can qualify to become a living organ donor. We don't want, it to, we don't want anyone out there to think that it's, this is an unattainable feat. This is something that can be done by anyone, whether he's a football player, whether he's a congressman, it doesn't matter. This is something that can be done by anyone. And I just want to say that uh, you know, I, was, I was just fortunate to be the one to do that. We have felt that we owe it not just to our families, not just to our friends, but to our community to start the foundation that we started. It's called the Ron Springs and Everson Walls Gift for Life Foundation. That foundation is going to be there to not just uh, provide uh, access and, and awareness to the problems with chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes, but our long-term goal would be to bring the care and that awareness to the people. Obviously, it affects everyone in the country, but we want to really bring it to the underserved areas of the country and allow them uh, to understand that, number one, you need to be tested frequently for chronic kidney disease. And number two, if you are a candidate to be a donor, then you should really consider doing that. Let me stop you there, Mr. Walls, and say thank you. Um, and we just got word that we will shortly be taking votes on the floor. But what we want to do now is try to uh, ask you some questions sure. and, and get your comments on that. And I'll go out of order and recognize my colleague and friend, Jim Costa of California. You may proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, again, for uh, your collaboration and uh, stepping up to the plate, as we say, uh, to be one of the original co-chairs of the Oregon uh, Donor and Tissue Caucus. Uh, I think um, collectively we have great opportunity to, to do good things. Uh, Mr. Uh, Walls, uh, the, uh, I suspect your friend and, uh, and colleague, Mr. Springs, will have an opportunity to see your testimony here if, if he's not watching it live. And uh, 
and uh, smile a great deal for which the passion you've spoken of of your friendship and your families. Um, and certainly that is the type of um, information and the role model that we have to convey to others out there because as we know the list is far too long uh, and too many die each year uh, waiting as your friend Mr. Springs uh, may have if it weren't for your willingness uh, to, to do your part as, as a friend. And, uh, but we know that as we try to deal with registry lists, as we try to, to uh, pursue other efforts that's contained in this legislation that uh, Congressman Clay has, has written that uh, I intend to support wholeheartedly, uh, we need to figure out other ways that we can use um, forums, uh, the media, uh, the organizations, some that are reflected here today, to get that message out uh, because, uh, and as I noted in my testimony, especially within minority communities. I mean, uh, I don't know how many here in the audience, but uh, I carry, if I can find it here, my California driver's license. On the back of the driver's license, we have uh, the option to determine whether or not uh, we want to be uh, listed on the registry as a potential organ donor. Uh, this morning I saw on the Day Today show where a family was interviewed uh, in which their daughter had been tragically killed uh, a year ago. And yet uh, she had spoken even as a 16 year old uh, months earlier about wanting to be an organ donor if at some point something happened. Sadly, something did happen. But her parents spoke uh, with great passion as you do. So uh, more of this effort needs to take place. Um, I want to ask you, uh, because I have my own anecdotal stories, as we all do, uh, when did you first become aware of, of the potential of, as we say, the gift of life, the, the potential uh, that you and all of us have as an organ donor? Was it through your uh, friendship with uh, Ron Springs, or was there a previous uh, awareness uh, that uh, came to you? Well, uh Congressman, I just have to say that uh, diabetes, uh, fortunately for my family, is, is nowhere in our history. And that's what made uh, what Ron and I went through pretty unique. Uh, I learned everything about chronic kidney disease and diabetes through uh, my friendship with Ron and the problems that he was having. Uh, you know, Ron is the kind of guy, uh, he's typical as any football player, got a lot of pride. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when it comes to having these type of life-changing problems, you know, we try, and, we try and sweep them under the rug. Right. But by listening to his, his, the conversations between my wife, Sherelle, and his wife, Adrian, by listening to those conversations. It came home. It came home. I, it was, the conversations would really upset my wife. And uh, I didn't really even get the original information from Ron himself. Mm -hmm. But then as I start to delve more into it, as I start to think about, okay, how, what can I do to help my friend, uh, that's when I start to do my research. You did your homework. I did my homework. And it was so strange that, you know, they talk about diabetes being the silent killer. Yeah. Well, you know, I was, I was typical of that because no one really wants to talk about it. And that's our goal here today, is to make sure and get that out to the public as much as possible. Well, Mr. Walls, we look forward to your active participation as a partner in our collective effort. And uh, I know Mr. Clay and myself and others of my colleagues have vi visited uh, dialysis units within our districts, both with chronic and acute dialysis. And I think you very, very um, uh, vividly described uh, what I have seen uh, when these patients come to these clinics three times a week, uh, hoping, hoping uh, against hope that there may be a better future for themselves and their families. So uh, this is very important work this afternoon, and Mr. Clay, I look forward to continuing to work with your efforts. Thank you so much, Mr. Costa. Let me also thank you for your leadership on uh, reviving our, our caucus, and uh, I'm looking forward to working working with you and uh, and the rest of our colleagues uh, on issues like this that raise the level of awareness uh, as far as organ donation, tissue donation are concerned. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. Walls, let me ask you about, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're all aware of health disparities, uh, as Mr. Costa said, and barriers to adequate uh, medical care facing the minority community. Uh, in your opinion, are community care providers such as community health clinics uh, and, and others adequately focusing their attention on preventative measures in order to reduce the number of patients with chronic kidney disease? Do you think there's enough attention on it? You know, Congressman, I'd have to say that the attention really needs to, to begin sooner than that. Uh, I think when you start talking about the food that we serve our kids in the elementary schools, which leads to uh, childhood obesity, uh, when you start talking about the lack of interest in the nutrition of all Americans here in this country, uh, I think to me that is at the root of what the problem is with chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes. If you want to talk about prevention, then it really needs to start, first of all, in the community. It needs to start in the home, and, and it needs to be, uh, you need to be aware of what you feed your children, what's healthy for them, and be aware of the history, not only in all Americans, but especially in minorities, and that our culture itself sometimes allows us to be subject to these problems stemming from childhood obesity. Wow. Thank you for that response. And, and one area of concern uh, in the medical ethics community is the level of donor education provided to potential living donors. Uh, from your experience, did you feel as though your transplant team worked uh, to provide you enough information about the potential risk uh, and complications associated with organ donation? Well, well, I've got to tell you, Congressman, when I first decided to do this, I was involved with some uh, kidney foundation programs and things of that nature because Ron was involved with it, and I wanted to see what was going on with that. And I, I, I have to say that when I first walked into a room, everyone knew I was going to donate a kidney to Ron, and I felt like I felt like I was uh, steak on a plate. <laughs> Yeah, you know, because everyone was looking at me like, oh, fresh kidney, fresh kidney. And, you know, that is, that is something that uh, I just had to get over. That was my own stigmatism there that I was dealing with. But I will say that the process itself, in my case, was just extremely helpful. It was extremely supportive because as a donor, the medical community, the team that I dealt with, they wanted to make sure that the donor is the one that's pampered. That's the one that is really the important piece of this puzzle. The recipient himself, of course, they want him to receive a healthy kidney, but they want to make sure that the donor is perfectly comfortable with the process. Because anytime you talk about laying your life down for someone, having major surgery, they don't want any apprehensions from the potential donor himself. And that's the way they made me feel, and I was very happy about that. And that's what made me feel comfortable about going through with the entire process. Now, you know, when, when we initially met, you shared with me the fact that um, uh, Ron Springs had no idea that you were going to donate your kidney to him. And just how did you break the news uh, to Mr. Springs? Well, that's <laughs> a crazy story because I didn't break the news to him. Okay. Uh, I don't know if, if you're aware, but Ron's son, Sean Springs, plays here in Washington for the Redskins. Yes. Uh, he wears my number 24 because, you know, I'm, 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 his, I'm his godfather. You don't hold that against him? I don't hold it against him. Playing for the Redskins, do you? Uh, it, didn't, it doesn't help him catch interceptions any, but it does help his <laughs> reputation. All right. But I will say that <laughs> You know, when you talk about a guy like Ron Springs, Ron is a guy that's been a very vocal person. He was always the, the lawyer of the locker room. So some would say he has a big mouth. Well, his son has a big mouth as well. <laughs> his son did a story in the Washington Post while uh, I was trying to keep this whole thing under wraps. And as he was being interviewed about his father's health because it was known that his father was in declining health, then he let it slip that Everson is considering 
becoming an organ donor to, to his father. And once that got out, not only in the Washington Post, in the days of the internet, uh, in less than 30 minutes, it was on the cover of ESPN.com. Okay. And so Ron <laughs> found out uh, through the media that this was gonna be done. And uh, of course, when he called me, he was so excited about it. And I said, yes, Ron, uh, after taking the information that you gave me, I didn't tell you that I was a complete match. And of course, Ron says, well, hell, let's get this done. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, when do you want to get it done? He said, let's do it tomorrow. I'm like, Ron, I, I need some time to tie down my family affairs. You know, I'm about to have major <laughs> surgery here. But uh, after a little bit of negotiating and, and uh, browbeating on his part, uh, we decided to not just come up with a date, but in our case, uh, because of us being high profile citizens, uh, being former athletes uh, in the city of Dallas, we had to give a false date. Uh, because if we didn't, then everyone, the, the, the hospital would have been inundated with phone calls about when is this surgery going to happen, when is it going to happen. And they, you really can't have that when it comes to transplant surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and what we did was we gave a false date in March, okay. and then we actually surprised everyone and came up with the surgery at the end of February on the 28th, and it worked out well for everyone. And I'm, I'm so glad it did. Um, um, you were... Re required to go through both a physical and mental screening process to ensure uh, you were a suitable candidate for donating a kidney. Um, and I guess that was after you just, you made up your mind that you were going to go through with this. Uh, what kind of experience was that? I mean, did they pro adequately prepare you mentally for uh, I guess the pitfalls, if anything went wrong. And, uh, you know, one thing that uh, it, it concerned me then and still concerns me now, uh, obviously, you know, when you give your kidney or any type of organ, you're never sure exactly how long it's going to last. And I've heard some stories out there from others who have received organ donations. And of course, you know, there, there is a time life to these parts. You know, the kidney may last 20 years for Ron. It may only last five years for Mr. Spring. So those were always my concerns, number one. Uh, number two is the, I was always in shape uh, physically. I tried to stay in shape. I jog, I work out a lot, swim, and do whatever I can do to try and stay physically fit. Uh, so I had no problems with the barrage of tests that came my way. Uh, they've got a test called Glofil, where you actually have to swallow iodine and get shot up with uh, a glofield substance that's allowed to test. It allows your specimen to illuminate, and they're able to better see exactly what's inside of you and just how healthy your kidneys are. Uh, very invasive procedure that you, know, you just don't want to step in too lightly. Uh, I had to take a CAT scan itself where they, they shoot you up with another substance that uh, goes through your body, and it feels almost like, like mint going from, from, from your arm to the top of your head, and it's, it's very uncomfortable, and that was for the CAT scan itself, uh, where Mr. Ro Mr. Springs was afraid I might have a problem was on the mental exam. <laughs> there was a 500-question mental evaluation uh, that he wasn't sure I was going to pass, and uh, thank God I passed through that with flying colors. So uh, in the midst of the little humor that we had uh, while these tests were going on, uh, it was still a, a process that I just will not forget. Physically and mentally, how is uh, Mr. Ron Springs doing? Mr. Springs uh, mentally has always had all his faculties. Uh, he has never changed his spirit and his approach to life. Uh, he was always the, 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 the clown of the party, you know, the guy that you just love to be around. And uh, so that's always been there. Uh, physically, uh, after Ron received the kidney, and this is the amazing thing about it, uh, immediately after the, the, the surgery, I mean the day after surgery, uh, his eyes were clearer, hmm. he could act, his vision was better, uh, his face, although ashen at the time that before surgery, all of a sudden it just, his color came to life okay. and you know, it was like if you didn't see him uh, from the waist down, 
you would not know that Ron had any problems or side effects from his chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes. So, you know, that's one thing that gives me joy as a donor is to see him, see how he looks, and, and every day that I see him uh, is, is a, a good feeling for me uh, that I feel that, you know, if, if nothing else, I did all I could for my friend, and he is much better off because of it. And uh, you and your friend have started a, a new foundation. Tell me, tell me what you expect to accomplish uh, with the uh, Everson Walls Round, uh, Ron Springs Gift for Life Foundation. Well, what we intend to do with this foundation is, first of all, make sure that no one has to go through what Ron Springs went through. Uh, give them a support base. Uh, give them awareness of how you can be affected by chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes. Uh, and also for those that have a trust factor uh, when it comes to going to the doctors and getting uh, tested to make sure that we uh, go into those underserved neighborhoods and give them their own tests. Uh, we want to also bring in former NFL players as well and get the support from not only the NFL players, but from the, the NFL and the NFL Players Association, and give them a, a, a helping hand in bringing some of our, our fallen soldiers, so to speak, who are really ailing out there and really don't have too much pride, really, to come to the doctor and be tested to see what kind of shape that their kidneys are in. So along with uh, helping out the retired players, and all of those in the underserved communities. We want to make sure that the awareness is there for the entire community so they can realize that before it's too late, you need to come in, get tested, because we don't want anyone to have to go through the uh, dialysis process that Mr. Springs went through. Well, I, I thank you for that, and uh, you can be assured that the Congressional Donor Caucus will be a partner uh, with you and Mr. Springs' efforts. Let me also thank you uh, for your testimony today. I, I believe that, Mr. Walls, you exemplify a new meaning of friend uh, by what you did, the, the, that, that act of courage that you demonstrated uh, by giving a piece of you to Mr. Springs in order to give him life. And I'm, I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful that you brought this to the attention of this nation because you're so high profile, and I certainly appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Let me say that this will conclude the testimony uh, for panel one. And again, we thank you, Mr. Walls, for your testimony, and you may be excused. And at this time, uh, we will, the subcommittee will recess and reconvene uh, after the vote. And, uh, I think it'll be within about a half an hour to 40 minutes. Thank you so much.